Very good evening to all of you and a warm welcome to the Wise Views interactive webinar series. And this is the fourth in the series. Some of the best uh, guest speakers we have been able to assemble all the while. And uh, this is yet another interesting webinar that we have put together for you. And uh, today we have uh, with us uh, Mr. Devendra Surana. He is uh, a noted industrialist and, uh, and uh, a thought leader based out of Hyderabad. And uh, we would like to present him today for you in this webinar, which is focused on evolving from the first gen business and what are the lessons for entrepreneurs and intrapreneurs. I would like to briefly explain the agenda for the day. We have the first 30 minutes of talk to be delivered by our guest, Mr. Devendra Surana, followed by a 15 to 20 minutes of interaction with the Professor R. Prasad, which is based on the questions raised by all the participants beforehand at the time of registering for this webinar. And uh, we will also, we have a cushion of additional 15 minutes uh, where if the, we are not able to handle the time, we will be able to use that time to connect with the speaker depending on his availability and then uh, resolve the queries that are raised by the audience. So this is roughly the plan that we have for today. It is my pleasure and a privilege once again uh, to present uh, Mr. Devendra Surana. He has a brilliant academic uh, record. He studied uh, from the prestigious Hyderabad Public School, uh, Begumpet. After that, uh, he has gone to Usman University College of Engineering and uh, then graduated from the Indian Institute of Management, Bangalore for his postgrad. I must mention here that uh, Mr. Devendra Surana is my co-alumnus at uh, Usman University College of Engineering and uh, also I am Bangalore. And I would not miss this opportunity of mentioning this fact. Uh, that's the reason and that's the advantage of introducing the guest. Uh, Mr. Devendra Surana uh, has achieved some feats and uh, made several accomplishments. He has been a noted member and uh, chief of various industry associations in, in, in Hyderabad as well as in India. And uh, briefly to mention that he was awarded the Entrepreneur of the Year in, the, in 2019, an award uh, by Hyderabad Management Association presented by the Vice President of India. Uh, he's also running a charitable trust in Bolaram, so charitable trust hospital in Bolaram for the last three decades. And currently he's the Managing Director of Bhagyanagar India Limited, also director on Surana Solar, manufacturers of copper products, auto electricals, and solar photovoltaic panels, uh, and solar and wind power generation. With this introduction, I would now request I would now request uh, Mr. Devendra Surana to start his talk, and I will stop sharing the screen uh, from here. Thank you, uh, Sudhakar. As uh, always, a pleasure to uh, be in a gathering with you, especially since we share both our alma mater. As this is a topic on uh, lessons learned in my life, please bear with me because I'll be talking a little bit about my own life because without that, it becomes very difficult to share the lessons which uh, I have got. So first of all, I must say that I was lucky. I am lucky. I am very, very lucky. I've got everything which I wanted without, uh, literally without having to really fight for it or really work very hard for it. Uh, because of the family in which I was born. I was uh, literally entitled. I went to a very good school, which gave me a great foundation to go ahead and uh, achieve my higher education in both college and uh, the institute where I went to. And I remember my early days, even before my asking, whether it was a cycle or clothes or anything, it was literally given to me before I really asked for it. So that's where, you know, I was an entitled child, but that is the first lesson which I learned in my childhood from my parents and my grandparents. The difference or the big difference for entrepreneurs or the children of entrepreneurs, the difference between entitlement and responsibility. So the lessons which I learned was this is not my entitlement, this is my responsibility. A responsibility that I've got all this given to me on a platter and I need to make use of this responsibility to ensure that it continues forward. And all the benefits which I got is not just for my own entitlement, but a responsibility to do good for the society, a responsibility to do good for my business, to ensure that my employees get better and to ensure that this continues forward. I want to give an example in front of my child, my son, I wanted to order a TV 
and I just called somebody and said, look, I want this. And the next day, the TV was there in my house without having to really work for it. And I, my son then checked everywhere in the city. The price which I got, the service which I got was far better than what he could have ever achieved anywhere. And he said, this is fantastic. I said, this is what is the entitlement or the uh, legacy which we have earned from our parents. He has done it because my parents have done good for the society. He has done it because I have a name. And he said, if I have an opportunity to serve you, I will be doing my best. So I wanted to teach my son that this is the responsibility which you get, that going forward further, you must get the same treatment and you must ensure that this treatment is carried forward. It is not the entitlement, but the responsibility which comes with the entitlement. I think the first lesson as an entrepreneur or a second gen entrepreneur is to understand this difference between responsibility and entitlement and ensure that it is the responsibility which we take forward and not the entitlement which we take forward. I've seen a lot of entitled kids who have spoiled their life because they feel that they are entitled to stuff and don't feel the responsibility to take the legacy. Then the second lesson, uh, the harsh second lesson is how do we celebrate failures? I joined my business in 1988 straight out of uh, college uh, after I did my MBA. I joined a thriving business and we did fantastic uh, business. The motto even then back in the 90s for our group was growth through innovation. We continued growth continued year on year. But 10 years down the line, if I look back to my business by the late uh, 90s, not a single rupee of revenue which I inherited in the year 1988 was still available to us. Now, the choice was very clear in front of us. We could always blame the government, the recession, the, you know, the great devaluation which happened and so many upheavals which happened in the 90s and say, look, the government was bad and we couldn't do this and we couldn't do that. All our businesses got changed. But we had to keep moving forward. We closed our old businesses and started new businesses and ensured that the new businesses gave us more revenue, more income. Me and my brothers moved on to new, new age businesses, whether it was uh, in those days, fiber optic cables or uh, telecom equipment or so many other issues which we went on. So the choice was very clear for us. Shall we be a victim and say that, look, everything is working against us and we are not in a position to move forward? Or do we be an entrepreneur and see an opportunity in every crisis which comes forward. There is a saying, the God opens one gate before he closes another. In today's world, in those days and especially in today's world, for every one gate which is closed, 10 gates are being opened. The opportunities are multifarious in every area which you look at. There is opportunity for growth. There is opportunity for doing better in life. But at the same time, the change is inevitable. Whatever businesses you are doing will face serious challenges every day, every month and every year. We have to come over, overcome these challenges and also move on to new businesses if we have to succeed in life. And this, I think, is a very critical lesson which you learned. I learned very early on in my uh, business and that is to celebrate failures. And this happens not only in a macro level when we change the entire businesses, but also in a micro level. If you uh, come to my factory any, any day, there are at least three or four special projects which are ongoing every uh, day. And these projects are on a continuous basis. Every three months, our target is to start something new or a new way of doing business or a new component or new something. And believe me, the mort uh, fatality rate or the mortality rate of these projects is very high. Almost 50% of this new ventures which we look at fail. The, if we start, stop to dissect why did we fail and who is responsible and what happened, we'll never be able to move forward. We only take the failures in our stride and celebrate the two, three, four new ventures which come out every year and say that we need to do more like this. And this continued, you can say literally for the last 30 years. And that's the reason even though the old businesses are dying very, very fast, we continue to thrive in a new environment because it's a continuous process of uh, 
renewal which we have at the factory and believe me i not only uh, give my maximum time to this type of new ideas or new ventures and ensure that there is full encouragement to the entire team who takes up this type of projects also it's a fact that i enjoy this part of my work the maximum so if i spent uh, the maximum time it is on this project the maximum reward i get in terms of my uh, satisfaction the work satisfaction also comes when this type of projects succeed so that is one thing which i think every entrepreneur every intrapreneur needs to look at is how do we do new things without sort of delving on the failures which are bound to be on the way for every one success there will be two failures when in any field which we look forward so we need to keep moving on keep celebrating this type of uh, successes and move forward so the second lesson which i am very clear is celebrating failure the third lesson which is slightly off track so while i am doing two three four projects on a daily basis i am very clear that uh, multitasking is what most entrepreneurs keep doing and they think that it is not only their birthright but it is essential to multitask if you want to be a successful entrepreneur one thing i have learned the hard way is multitasking is the enemy of productivity while many projects can go on but at one point we need to focus only at one project and ensure that there is full clarity and focus and coherence for the entire team so that uh, you know people flipping from one project to another coming back to the first one and going back to the third one doesn't happen and this is especially true as you go down to the shop floor levels multitasking at the lower levels is even big killer of productivity if you get people to move from one project to another and back to another it will definitely ensure that he is not good uh, going to perform in any of the projects given to him so that is one thing which uh, i wanted to do i have seen all the people i know talking while do, working on a document or looking at a tv while doing something else talking on a phone and then you know uh, similarly interacting with somebody else i think this is one of the biggest uh, failures which i realized maybe about 15 or 20 years into my uh, journey as an entrepreneur i attended a, a seminar on theory of constraints and that's where we you know actually did a project on how bad multitasking is and it opened my eyes multifold i was a, a video games freak i played every game on the uh, phone whether it is the snake or the tetris or anything and if there is one productivity killer it is a game on a phone i think that is one thing which all entrepreneurs all entrepreneurs in fact everybody should avoid see we need entertainment we need to do things we can play a video game on computer which is not available to us all the time but if you get addicted to a game on the phone i've seen it really uh, kills your initiative and productivity um, why i am saying this uh, there are a couple more points which i want to say when in multitasking i have a saying routine sets you free it is con- counter uh, in, in, intuitive that a routine will set you free but believe me it is very very clear i have set a routine that all my normal dreary boring jobs which need to be done which cannot be avoided are set at a particular time of the day so every day one hour i set aside for doing all my routine jobs so any other when the routine jobs comes and disturb me at any other time i say no that has to be done only in that window so that i can keep my rest of the day free for creative works innovative works and do something which really matter for the business so one hour a day one day a week is what i keep for all my boring and dreary routine jobs which must be done as an entrepreneur because you cannot get away from that that is part of life the second thing which you might have heard but i want to repeat it is most of us are working for a business most of the time we are working for a business we are ensuring that the business is successful we ensure that the deliveries happen we ensure that the sales get done and so on and so forth but the most productive thing is when you work on the business that means what do you want to do on your business in the future how does your business look 
two years down the line or five years down the line? How much time can you spend working on the business rather than working for the business? This is a very important thing, especially for entrepreneurs at the top of the value chain. And also for intrapreneurs or leaders in the business, I have seen that, you know, even though the top people can do it, the second level normally gets stuck in the dreary day-to-day -day job throughout the day. It should not happen. The second level leaders and the third level leaders also should work on the business to ensure that the efficiency and productivity in future goes. And the last saying, which is counterintuitive, you'll see that I'll be saying a lot of counterintuitive things, which have stuck in my mind, which really don't make a lot of sense. I have a saying, you are the most productive when you're doing nothing. As leaders of businesses, we need to set aside time when we are doing nothing. Because great ideas, earth shattering ideas only happen when you're doing absolutely nothing. Nothing means no TV, no phone and no work which is happening. Just the thoughts which come to you when you're doing nothing is what changes the business for the future. So this is another thought which I spend a lot of time doing nothing. And I feel that it is the most productive time for my business. The next learning, which is absolutely which I think everybody says, and which is much easier said than done, is delegation. Delegation, delegation, delegation. For an entrepreneur and an entrepreneur to be successful, it is not his one mind or his two hands which will make him successful. It is the team and the team below the team which really builds a business. No one man, no group of, small group of people can really make a business successful. So you need to learn the art of delegation to ensure that at every level in your organization, people are working as entrepreneurs. People are not working as just a pair of hands, but with a great set of mind to ensure that the business grows in which it's, it is done. Like I said, it is much easier said than it is done, especially moving from a first generation to a second generation. It becomes even more difficult. In the first generation entrepreneurs, everything is under the control iron fist control of the uh, owner, manager, entrepreneur. And it is very difficult for us to give up those con that control. It is very difficult to give up control, but believe me, it is impossible to grow without giving up the control. So this is the great uh, thing which I learned much later in my life that without delegation, we cannot grow beyond a particular point. And delegation does not mean delegation of you know, I have delegated and then still you feel that it's not get delegated. I have found that we should not interfere in the working of our business, even when we don't agree with what our team is doing. That is a test of a delegation. We should not interfere in our work, even when there are losses which are being caused by our team. Because the minute you start interfering in those activities, you'll find that all the decisions will be pushed up back to you. Once you correct your team and say, look, you have lost a little money. You could have done this better this way. Next minute before taking a decision, he will call you and ask you, sir, shall we do it this way or that way? And this will keep going on until you are fed up with the whole idea and your delegation will still be just be on paper. So the test is how can you keep aside without interfering even when things are not going fully according to your thinking or what could be possible or what is up to you. The second part of delegation, which is very, very important, listen to your team. Listen very, very carefully. And this is where a lot of entrepreneurs miss out. Because when you listen, it is not just listening, but you have to listen, accept whatever they are saying with a lot of time given to it. So listening is a very important part of delegation, which a lot of us miss out. And I missed out in the earlier part of my career. The second is when a time is, when you are asked to give a decision, do not procrastinate. When somebody in your team asks you to give a decision, you need to give that decision immediately along with the reasoning why you're giving that decision. So while delegation is important for them to take their own decision, but if they ask you to take a decision sometime, you take a decision, give them the rationale behind the decision, 
and encourage to, them to take that same decision next time on the same basis. So that is something which I found uh, very important in terms of uh, growth as an entrepreneur. I'll just uh, briefly tell you what I learned from two very great people in uh, delegation. Uh, though I don't fully subscribe to Warren Buffett's uh, theory and I'm not really his fan, but one thing which stuck to my mind, he says he has only three things on his to-do list. Everybody has a to-do list and he has only three things on his to-do list. And this is not a to-do list of the day, but it is probably a to-do list of a week or a month. So he has only three things which he needs to do. The rest of the stuff is delegated to everybody else. So that's how you need to do. You should have a very small to-do list, whether it's an entrepreneur or an entrepreneur. Even the intrapreneur within the group, the next level, the CEO or the president or the vice president or the GM needs to reduce his to-do list and ensure that he delegates it further. So this is a very important thing on the delegation front. The other thing which I've learned from another person, again, I don't subscribe to his philosophy or policies, but uh, the learning from wherever it comes is really good. So he said when, you, when somebody asked him, how do you delegate things? And his very simple answer was with the power of ignorance. He says I, the easiest way to delegate things is that be ignorant of stuff. Don't ask people to report to you hundreds of data. You just be ignorant of most of the operations which are happening. Obviously, the entire thing will be delegated because your team knows that the boss doesn't know the entire detail behind it. They will not come back to you again and again for any decision. So that is the power of ignorance. If you can reach that level of delegation, that is true level of delegation. He adds another point when he says the power of ignorance, he says he, what he calls the power of diplomacy. So what he has is he has two or three critical things which he needs to work on, whether it is uh, managing the environment or managing a particular new project. So two or three things he will use Sam, Dam, Dan, Bhed. He will do whatever in his power to ensure that two or three things are done. Because you are ignorant of 95% of the activities, you can concentrate on 5% of your activities with 100% focus. And that is what is required for an entrepreneur. To ensure the success of a business, the entrepreneur must concentrate on things which are of real, real value. The biggest uh, constraint in an organization. Most people will say it's either funds or, you know, manpower or talent or materials or machinery. The biggest constraint for a growth of an organization is the bandwidth of the person at the top. And you need to conserve it for a very few critical items which are going to be earth changing. So that is the power of delegation which I found very, very important as we continue on our journey of growth and uh, diversification. The last uh, lesson uh, before we open for interaction for me in this journey has been create value. As an organization, as a person, create value for everybody around you. Create value through business, create value through innovation, not through appropriation. There are two ways of creating value. You can take part of the value created by somebody else and get it for yourself. What I would call rent seeking. But you can create value by, uh, by changing the form, by doing whatever businesses. In my copper business, we have a policy that we create value for our customers through QCDS. That is quality, cost, delivery, and service. These are the four ways in which we create value to our customers in every which way. So the focus should be singular, create value. Part of the value will come back to you, no matter what. If you create value, value will come back to you. So I always give a case study that suppose there is a chance you can increase value of 200 rupees for your customers. You will have to spend 100 rupees. The customer is not willing to pay for it. 
you would expect him to pay 100 and 100 125 150 rupees for a value of 200 which you create but for various reasons the customer might not be able to pay for it he might be saying that i will give you 50 rupees or 75 rupees or nothing at all so the question comes do you still go ahead and create that value to your customer and in my journey of 30 years especially when you have long term customers creating that value of 200 rupees extra even at your own cost pays back multifold in the future and this is something which you know is so counterintuitive if the customer is not paying why will you spend the money and that is some learning which i have found uh, that even in small businesses b2b businesses b2g businesses even b2g businesses where the government sometimes just cannot pay you it makes sense to do it because the value will come back to you sometime or the later uh, one of the biggest examples of this is google earth i don't know if you uh, all of us use google earth google maps it creates 3 billion dollars value for its customers and virtually nothing nothing goes back to google but it has created such a huge value for the customers and we see google is thriving and growing it still might not be getting money out of google maps as much as it spends but that is what is required in the world if you can create value for your customers the value will come back to you in some way or the other some time or the other so that is one thing which we need to look at and when we talk about creating value it is not only creating value for your customers it is creating value for your all your stakeholders whether it is your shareholder whether it is to your employee whether it is to your community which is a very important part of creating value in any community which you are whether it is a business community or the locality where the uh, uh, factory works or your small community in terms of your uh, class or your religion creating value everywhere will pay off in a big way not only to you as an individual but also to the business as a business with the corporate social responsibility which people talk about if we can use it properly it creates value and i think that's a very important part of uh, life lesson which i have heard and to end the talk i will end with my favorite saying which uh, sudhakar and a few people must have heard been sick of hearing is make your customer lazy that is the ultimate way of creating value to your customer we have to move beyond customer satisfaction customer delight to making your customer lazy to ensure that the customer gets what he wants before he needs it to ensure that he doesn't have to work to get any of your product or service thank you very much i think we are through with 30 minutes so i'll open it for discussion great sir uh, thank you very much what a set of uh, lessons almost all of them are counter intuitive if we look at it from a normal vanilla 2d kind of view that we have for the workplace or for the work itself amazing sir i'm sure we have a lots of questions to unravel those uh, uh, many more learnings that are there with you as an entrepreneur and uh, before i move on to the next one let me mention that i'm proud of uh, mentioning this again and again mr devendra rana was awarded the brain of the batch at uh, iim bangalore and uh, there must be a reason why subsequently that award is not given to anyone i have gone to i am bangalore after several years after uh, mr devendra surana passed out but uh, but you know the the reason is obvious and you will discover that in the subsequent responses he would have for the questions uh, that are prepared uh, now i take uh, uh, the privilege of introducing the moderator professor r prasad good evening professor yeah professor r prasad uh, uh, is a, is a distinguished alumnus of uh, uh, iit bombay and uh, i am calcutta he is currently the director for the academic wing of icfi group and uh, he has actually uh, architected the online mba program which is the latest product from uh, the portals of icfi uh, university group and uh, he is also uh, the professor and mentor for this online mba program and he is the moderator for the session today over to you professor r prasad you're still muted uh, professor yeah please unmute thank you mr sudhakar and uh, thank you uh, professor surana i'll indeed call you that because you bring in a, uh, you know the, the framework of uh, insights along with uh, 
the the practice that you carry with you and which is very much needed in the world of business and management in fact i wish we had more people who would be able to bring in far more practice uh, uh, than what is happening today so thank you and i must say that uh, you know the, the the way in which you have uh, called out from your experience and uh, uh, given us very practical insights is something that a lot of uh, uh, people in industry and also a lot of people who come in from uh, work and then get into academics uh, look for very eagerly uh, there are a lot of frameworks which are available out there but uh, i think the, the the moment it comes from somebody who's got a background and practice it's far more inspirational so and i think the volume of comments that we see in the chat box is a tribute to that thank you indeed uh so let me what we have tried to do is we've got uh, you know about 70 to 80 questions when we did the registration so we've kind of aggregated it and uh, uh, for your benefit you know i've tried to put it into uh, some sort of sections uh, which we thought were important and uh, to keep the session interesting you know uh, uh, the sessions will be the sections will be alternated between me and mr sudhakar so I, i'll start off with the session with the section which i've aggregated on the mindset uh, the mindset is something that uh, the entrepreneur brings in uh, to how he or she does the work. When we listen to you, you know, we are able to understand certain things which comes from a certain mindset. So in this mindset section, there are a few questions. So I, I'll start with the uh, first one. Uh, I, I've called out from some surveys and here particularly I've taken from the Global Entrepreneurship uh, Monitor. And uh, here, here is the first one. In, in India, we have about 56% of adults who've started a business due to the pandemic and about 60% who stopped a business due to the same pandemic. Uh, and both these uh, percentage figures, when taken with that of about uh, 43 to 46 other countries globally, uh, are much higher. So both of them speak different. Uh, so the question here is, how do you see the Indian mindset to be different when it comes to you know this uh, decision to start and the decision to stop? And what perhaps could be the factors driving this? So, um, without being very uh, jingoist about it, I think the Indian uh, mind, the we are much more um, sharper in intellect. And uh, that goes for both the good and bad because we are very entrepreneurial, we are very Jugaad types, but we find it very difficult to follow systems. And that is the same thing, re uh, reason why people are very quick to start a new business. They can understand a business model much faster than anybody across the world. I think other than maybe Chinese people. I've seen Indian and Chinese people are really very intelligent when you want to look at a business model and how we can get something out of it. Like I mentioned, uh, it's not just the pandemic. The age we are in, the changes are going to be faster and faster. The opportunities which are there are going to be huge but at the same time, existing opportunities, the window is short. And you might find that the window for that opportunity closes very fast. So, for example, with D, uh, if you look at the way things are happening, the customer is getting directly e-commerce and stuff like that. The entire distribution chain, the entire wholesale region, the entire retail trade will all get into a toss. So, in every area which you start looking at it, you will find that people are getting... Uh, totally disturbed in the way work is happening. But that also means there are equal opportunities. So you'll see more and more cases where people get out of business and more and more places where people get into business and get a spectacular success out of business. So my advice, like I said in my own uh, presentation, we have got out of so many businesses over the last 20, 30 years, but we have started more businesses at the same time. So you need to continuously keep doing that thank you professor i think that's a that's a very uh, uh, very very encouraging way of looking at the situation and indeed indeed for the kind of uh, people that we have in our country it, it quite uh, correlates so so uh, here we have the second question and uh, i've just given some background to it there are quite a number of questions which come up in this we have you know about 83 percent uh, plus indians who feel there are very good opportunities to start a business this is findings in 2020 in the area they live in and about 82 percent who feel that they have the capabilities which includes knowledge skill and experience to start a business and these uh, supposedly rank amongst the highest in the world amongst the same 43 to 46 companies 
now the the other side of the story is that uh, there are about 57% of indians who will not start a business for fear that it might fail the fear of failure and uh, this is the highest globally uh, coupled with this the early stage entrepreneurial activity and established business ownership is also one of the lowest in india at about uh, 11% the intent to start a business in 3 years of course these are from surveys so you know we have to take it with that kind of a filter uh, uh, the intent to start a business in 3 years is only uh, 20% and this is also below the global average uh, while the entrepreneurial frameworks which are existing the government the finance the social uh, cultural education etc as rated by experts is supposed to be above average and near good so we have got about three factors which are positive which are opportunities capabilities and the entrepreneurial framework conditions and we have got two things which are uh, you know which are uh, lower than the global average one is the fear of failure and the other is the uh, uh, early stage entrepreneurial activity and uh, established business ownership so uh, how how do we read this how do we improve on this professor so uh, the fact is there entrepreneurship especially the early stage startups have a very high level of mortality you cannot expect everybody who starts a new business with a new idea uh, to really succeed uh, again i have a very uh, favorite quote for the a startup has to be a impossible combination of two things a poet and a banya a poet to dream up something which is different and a banya to take the last penny out of the business now these two combinations are very very difficult in in a startup and we will continue to see mortality rates for startups happening the reason why we have a failure of success in india uh, which is higher than the rest of the world is we don't have a adequate safety net for the people who fail and the uh, concept of celebrating failures like i mentioned in my uh topic is not there a failure in indian society especially in your own community in your own family will be such a big stigma on you that you don't want to take that chance you know your wife your mother everybody will look down upon you there is no celebration of failures in india the other reason why we are not so successful in startups is uh, you know i keep saying that you know the safety net of a job which a lot of people look for in india over the last 20 30 years unfortunately it has been put in our brain that a safe secure job in the government sector is probably what we should be aiming for things are changing things are changing fast especially with the examples which are coming uh, of successful people uh, who have started the businesses but these are practical problems which are here to say we need to change the mindset it is not going to happen in a day or two and believe me for every one success there will have to be three failures i am talking of my own example in my factory on a daily basis but it's how you take it and how you move forward thank you prof i i especially like the concept of you know the celebrating failures and the fact that in our society indeed indeed it is seen all around us that you know right from when one is young that if something goes wrong in school uh, you know in the in the marks and then you have the parents after the it starts there and then it goes on and i think that's a very vital uh, cultural aspect and uh, we need to see how we can improve on that the uh, uh, next question professor is about you know there are two contrasting situations these have come up from the questions themselves uh, and there these are this is connected to that uh, you know that uh, the safety net that you're talking about how do you take a risk if you have a settled job this is one part of the story and uh, the second part of the story is that because they did not get a job after their studies they started a business now how do you what is what is your advice when you combine these situations first of all uh, calling me professor is putting me off the this thing because uh, i am not a professor but uh, yes um, on the see that safety net of a job which uh, deters people from getting the taking the entrepreneurial plunge is very very uh, difficult but you have to understand an entrepreneur needs to continuously pivot uh, taking it as a last resort because you don't get a job is not such a bad idea because to succeed in uh, the, the there is a say you know that it's darkest before the dawn so in every entrepreneurial organization uh, opportunity if you talk to any of the big people 
just before they became spectacularly success, they were looking at failure down the road. It's only when people become uh, passionate because of desperation that you will see that success happen. So you need that drive in people. I do. I wouldn't per, uh, look at a person who's happy in a uh, safe job. I wouldn't push him to get into a uh, entrepreneurial venture unless he has the passion for it. Because success in business doesn't come easy. It requires sleepless nights. I I have two things which I I can talk from my own experience. Today I work literally two to three hours a day, literally. But believe me, my mind is working 24 hours on the business. So that mindset of working 24 hours, continuously thinking how you can improve the business, what you can tweak so that the whole business can change is very much required for a successful entrepreneur. Physically working on in the business doesn't really give you the full success. So that is something which we need to understand. And sometimes a success in an entrepreneurial organization will happen only with the back to the wall. There is one uh, question which came, uh, which I find a lot of uh, people uh, keep asking me. We delegate our work to our senior employees and we train them and we ensure that they come to a good level, they keep working. And then they take not only uh, the job, but also the knowledge outside. And what do we do to such uh, a situation? We are afraid of giving our, you know, IP delegation because then there is a vacuum in the organization. You know, similar question, how do you trust somebody? Because anybody can uh, dupe you. I'm saying both have full risk, but you cannot work without that. You have to ensure that your people stay with you for a longer time and whatever knowledge they get out of delegation gets institutionalized into the organization. So somebody work is delegated, but you can also build systems around it so that the organization learns from it, not only the next in line, whom you have delegated work and whom you have empowered. The learning of that person should also get institutionalized so that you have to ensure that the delegation goes to the next level also. So if this person goes, the next person comes up with similar knowledge and comes up to that same level. You cannot come to a situation that we don't lose people. Yes, we can try to ensure that we keep our people. In my organization, I have a good track record of uh, retaining people for a very, very long time. And it comes not only from monetary rewards, but from other aspects as well. But this is a risk we need to take if we need to grow. I've seen a lot of entrepreneurs do not delegate because they're afraid this person will learn, not only will he go away, but he'll also take my business secrets away. That's the clearest way of bringing down your organization and within five to seven years, getting into that victim mentality and closing down the business. We need to avoid that mentality at first. I saw that question in the chat box, so I thought I'll just reply. Thank you, sir. I, I, I acknowledge your uh, discomfort on the uh, professor designation. Thank you. Thank you. I'll, 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 uh, what we do now is I'll hand it over to Mr. Sudhakar and uh, Thank you. he has a section that he will ask. Thank you very much. I'll now focus on uh, a different bucket of questions which are aggregated from the responses of uh, the members who have joined and they were quite eagerly wanting to know about uh, these things. Sir, uh, we have often heard that people saying that business is in my blood. So the question is, are entrepreneurs born or is it a skill that can be learned? So what are the what are the qualities and what are the skills that one has to learn if it can be learned? Uh, so the answer is both yes and no. You are born as well as you can be taught. There are a few inherent uh, things like risk-taking abilities, uh, the ability of, um, you know, going beyond your uh, uh, comfort zone and doing business, which are very much required for entrepreneurship. But I will not uh, refute the fact that uh, entrepreneurship is in my blood is a true saying. So talking from my own experience, right from the age when I was probably about 10 or 12, it used to be my job to connect calls for my dad and uh, give it to him with business uh, people. And then I used to hear how he used to talk to business people, how he used to discuss uh, what's happening in the factory. And that definitely gives people from business families an edge because 
business is there not only not really in the blood but it is there on the dining table it is there on the uh, play area it is there everywhere around you you can see the business happening and it gives you a much better aptitude for business in future so definitely there is a, a positivity there but given a few basic things i think entrepreneurship can also be learned very well and much later in life uh, proper training in terms of especially the risk taking being outside the comfort zone a lot of people you know unless all the boxes are ticked they cannot move so um, entrepreneurs need to move without having the entire data in their head that is one thing which happens in most of the cases on a day to day basis so some of these things you can learn as you move forward and like i said the biggest teacher is back to the wall a back to the wall situation teaches much more of entrepreneurship than any mba or any entrepreneurship course can teach you in life great sir thank you very much uh, i think uh, that gives a, a great deal of clarity for those who want who are wanting to start up now startup uh, is a is a big buzz not just in india but around the world and in india it's much more these days compared to the days in the past when we start up now we are definitely looking for partners either in terms of capital in terms of passion in terms of uh, uh, acumen in terms of uh, in terms of talent in itself now how do we find trustworthy partners sir do you have any clues or any hints for us so uh, you are talking from a a venture capitalist pers pers perspective or the entrepreneur's perspective entrepreneur's perspective so uh, so from a entrepreneur's perspective when you go and look out for seek venture capital you wouldn't have too much choice about it but be very careful as to what are the terms which you are signing on and uh, i have seen uh, most of the people in the initial stages when you interact you will get to know what is it the venture capitalist is expecting from us so look at people who are interested in growth look at people who are looking at a slightly longer term than an exit and uh, if somebody is just looking at a 3x exit in 3 years probably that is not the right approach for you to look at but people who are looking at growth people who are looking at mentoring you i think the best way of uh, startup uh, funding is look at partners who are willing to mentor you who are willing to you know make connections for you as a startup you will have a lot of problems maybe whether it is in taxation whether it is connecting with the right uh, resource for sourcing for rights resource for sales so any uh, venture capital or a person who's investing in you if he is also investing time in giving you this mentoring helps i think that is what you should look at that will help you get a better uh, partner for the future money even if he gives you a little less is okay as long as he's mentoring you. great thank you sir uh, the other side of the question or the other side of the answer that you have given Uh, lies in the aspect of funding in itself is it easier to get the bank loans or to raise funds from say venture capital uh, and and given the fact that rbi has cut the interest rates is it helping if it is to what extent it is helping for the startups to raise uh, funds uh, startups you will not be able to access bank funds easily because banks will look at so many in spite of all the cgt msc that is without collateral guarantee scheme and all those uh, initial stages you will have to go to a uh, either friend friends families is the first stage second is venture capitalist and banks will come only much later when you are looking at scaling up after the business model is evolved and you are looking at scaling up that is when uh, bank loan will come into be so uh there is a saying a bank loan is good for people who have a very steady cash flow an equity is good for people who have uncertain cash flow in a startup situation the cash flows are always uncertain so always keep looking at equity until you are quite certain of your cash flows down the line the bank loan will probably come 3 to 5 years after the startup great sir yes. thank you very much for this bank interest yes. have come down so for people like me bank interest are better right now great thank you sir uh, uh one more uh, question in the bucket of uh, startups or the concerns for the startups uh, i would like to raise here sir 
is that uh, <clears throat> now we are all uh, experiencing pandemic. There is a lot of uncertainty going around. Now, what is your advice to those uh, startups or what kind of ventures, what kind of opportunities that they should look for? Because there are risks of all kinds. The risks are much more than the normal time. Non-pandemic is different from pandemic. What opportunities they should pursue and how do they minimize their failure rate? I mean, already the failure is very, very high in startups. And in such ventures, as you mentioned in your talk, uh, for every success, there are more than two failures. Now, how do they manage the risk? How do they minimize the risk? And what are the survive and sustain strategies that you advise them? And if they, if they already have launched the venture, how do they survive and sustain? This is the set of questions that we have for you, sir. Tough question, uh, Sudhakar. Um, pandemic is definitely a, a very tough time for uh, startups because startups thrive in continuous idea exchange, meeting people, getting things out there. Today, when people are not out there, it is really tough. So uh, not saying that for some startups, it's still a good time. But right now, is uh, my personal take is for the next six months or one year, things are going to be quite tough uh, for the startup uh, environment because you have to understand one thing. Startups thrive on ideas and ideas come when there is an exchange of thought, when people meet up, why do we have incubation hubs? Because 50 people with a lot of energy sit together and we don't realize how the idea exchange happens there. All of us are thinking of different ideas, but so many of the basic concepts are same. And that is why it is very important to have this, you know, um, startup hubs and where people of startups meet, they interact, maybe just have a meal or a drink together. That is where the ideas happen. And today, unfortunately, until this pandemic is over, hopefully it will be over in six months to nine months. It is a tough scene. I mean, I don't want to sugarcoat uh, that by saying it is not. Um, depending on each individual startup, there might be some startups which are still good for pandemic, you know, things which you now, for example, e-commerce, delivery, and all those things, areas are really picking up. So areas which help in those type of services will definitely be a good thing for startups where social distancing is the norm, where people cannot move around. So if you see the Dunzos and the Rapidos, they are making great strides now. So those are easy names which I have taken. But if your business or your service model is more towards helping people stay away from the crowd, it will be more successful. But if you are dependent on more crowdsourcing or getting people to meet people, it is tough time. No sugar coating. Thank you, sir. That's, that's a great deal of direction for all of us. Uh, I will now pause for a while here and I'll hand over uh, uh, to Professor Rav Prasad for the next bucket of questions. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Sudhagar. I hope the audio is on. Yes, it is. Uh, this, this section is related to uh, entrepreneurship and uh, intrapreneurship. And just for the benefit of the audience, uh, the entrepreneurial employee or the intrapreneur is someone who develops business activities as part of their job. So this could involve activities such as creating and launching new products, services, or a process. Or it could, or it could mean establishing a new business entity. Now, uh, this again, you know, if we if you look at uh, India compared to uh, the rest of the world, uh, the level of entrepreneurial employee activity in India is 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 pretty low. It's at about uh, zero point three percent, which is one of the lowest amongst uh, all the uh, economies. Uh, 43, 48, 46 economies surveyed. So, uh, what do you do to increase this figure? I mean, how do you how do you increase such a figure in this world of change? So uh, this is this is this so is the, the entrepreneurial uh, employee is actually more important than the entrepreneur himself. And for any entrepreneur to be successful, he must have not one but a set of entrepreneurial employees. And believe me, I have seen uh, across businesses, small and big, every business has entrepreneurial employees. The problem is it gets stuck at one number one, two, or three, and that too at the top level. At lower down the level, we don't find entrepreneurial employees. The people just below the entrepreneur are typically, typically entrepreneurial. 
in india if you look at the msme and stuff like that the chief person under the head is entrepreneurial but he has a lot of he becomes a control freak in future that is where i think we have to move beyond the first level of entrepreneurs to a second level of entrepreneurs which i don't see happening in many organizations in india i agree to that part of it so how do we do it uh, my presentation if you look at the delegation and looking at success uh, celebrating failures is all about that only if you can delegate without asking questions you will create entrepreneurs the minute you start asking questions why did this go wrong you will stifle that entrepreneurship which is inherently available in the indian mindset let me be very very clear the indian mindset the jugadu mindset of indians has full entrepreneurship fully packed into it it is being killed by the way we control our people and i have seen it many times across industries the first level of employees become entrepreneurs but they kill it in the second and third level so that is where we need to institutionalize that habit of uh, celebrating uh, failures of not commenting on mistakes even a simple comment that this was a mistake means next time before he takes an action he'll come back to you and ask whether i should do this or that and that's the end of entrepreneurship and entrepreneurship need not be just you know uh, doing a new product but it is also a new way of delivering the service a new way of uh, you know getting things done at the lower level so that is also entrepreneurship it need not be just a new product or in a macro sense uh, becoming an entrepreneur even in smaller ways they can become entrepreneurs whether it is a maintenance team and i have seen you know the entrepreneurship happening maximum in the maintenance teams in india they are really good at uh, jugad work the maintenance teams are the teams which really you know work on the site and get things done we need to just encourage it that's it thank you sir i think you know the point about uh, uh, a lot of uh, people being control freaks and the point of uh, uh, delegating and then celebrating failure is is the big take away there the the next uh, query is uh, uh, no basically arises about uh, if you want to uh, build you know uh, uh, organizations which adopt a growth and innovation mindset uh, how do you instill this mindset in executives in a manner of speaking you have already addressed it in the previous question but then would you like to add to it uh, see you have to make it a way of life um right from top to the bottom we need to keep looking at it and uh if i have realized one thing you know what uh, the top team focuses on gets done so if the top team is focusing on innovation on growth uh, what is happening instead of looking at uh, being a bean counter or what is your costing where have you spent money what is the expenditure level at uh, various activities it depends on where you are putting the focus on and that is uh, and you know we are blessed we are blessed with an economy which is growing at one of the biggest rates we are blessed with the human resources which is far beyond anywhere else in the world and at a reasonable cost so we are blessed we need to take this opportunity and put it to both growth as well as innovation i think making innovation a way of life yes and practicing it daily and uh, the leaders doing so for that so that the others also learn from that behavior and continue with it so yes. i mentioned jugad and somebody is asking me a manisha is asking me a question whether jugad is good for the indian uh, entrepreneurship or otherwise so you know like i said jugad is good but if jugad comes in the way of creating systems which it does in india we have to make a difference between jugad and creating systems so if it is creating systems it's definitely not good and people confuse the two people think jugad automatically means breaking systems in a way it is short circuiting systems but that is where you have to make the difference you have to take the jugad and ensure that it is systemized in the whole system the thought process with jugad comes in the mind of people as jugad means no system and to a certain extent right but we need to institutionalize the whole system to ensure that suppose a jugad works ensure that it becomes systemized not that you know uh, 
typical way of jugad there is no plug on the wire and the person takes two wires and puts it in the socket that is jugad but if you are institutionalizing that jugad it is the most dangerous thing so that is not the jugad which i am talking about you know sometimes people confuse but jugad suppose you are making a new way of doing things with much less resources that is my definition of jugad getting things done with less resources not with a shortcut of systems that is what is jugad which can lead to innovation I thank you sir uh, thank you also for answering the, the the related query which has come up in the chat box yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, here you know i can't help but recollect our late, late founder uh, shri nj yashasvi so i remember a small episode you know when i was joining i joined up after about 10 years of an entrepreneur being an entrepreneur and then he asked me uh, uh, you know uh, uh, one of the questions i remember very clearly which he asked me is uh, do you think you will be able to adapt to systems uh, yes so i think you know it very well connected to uh, what you are saying thank you sir thank you by the uh, way i have interacted with mr yashashwi uh, way back i mean probably in the first year of my working and uh, did learn from it thank you thank you uh, then there's a direct question from one of our uh, very esteemed colleagues and that is you know how do how do executives learn from entrepreneurs how do executives learn from entrepreneurs this is um, within the same organization there is of course the leadership impact happens so um, what the leader of the organization typically moves down the line but you know entrepreneurship can teach people across geographies across histories and that is the reason um, executives entrepreneurs should read or see small videos of successful businessmen and entrepreneurs whether it's steve jobs i have quoted a couple vedanta anil agarwal and uh, warren buffet you might not agree to whatever they say but you will always find nuggets of information which are suitable to you which will improve your whole learning see when you are learning from entrepreneurship i don't want you to do hero worship use your own mind to say that yes i mean look at that brilliance of anil agarwal power of ignorance is running such a big business and he says i want to be ignorant of what is happening in my business 95% of the time so that i can concentrate my 5% on things which really matter so content so you can learn from that type of things when you see their short videos reading might be a good option and it's not in fashion nowadays but i would always recommend reading uh, but small videos ted talks you can learn from a lot of these things when uh, you see their interviews on tv um follow follow big business people whenever they talk on tv or anywhere and you might get a small nugget of information and believe me one small nugget of information is enough to change an entrepreneur's life it might not be enough to change an executive's life but for an entrepreneur one small nugget of information in totally unrelated area will change the entire mind thank you that's a very practical tip you know uh, seeing small videos interviews and and trying to take away using our own uh, metal framework uh, thank you sir for that i think you know the next uh, section is about the family business and uh, i'd hand it uh, to mr sudhakar to do the honors now uh, i was uh, <clears throat> my mind was actually meandering around uh, the jugad thing because jugad evokes lots of questions uh, but then uh, professor prasad has asked me to look at uh, family business uh, <clears throat> uh, Uh, sir one question i have uh, which is actually reflecting the aspirations of many members who have joined today is that uh, uh, supposing i have a family business like the way you have family business before you ventured out to study your post graduation in management you already had an established family business supposing i have a family business why should i join my family business are there any advantages to start with in the sense that it is a tip that you are giving somebody who already has a family business why should i join and the second question is how do i scale up or how do i evolve from there from the first gen business what are the tips what are the what are the lessons or what are the uh, important things that i have to keep in mind when i scale up from my first gen business this is the set of questions for you sir thank you the whole uh, chapter <laughs> the answer of uh, joining a family business 
uh, but uh, i have a strong feeling on that i have seen a lot of my friends and uh, relatives who don't want their kids to join their family business they feel that the business is not worth joining and to them i want to give this message that you are mistaken the grass is always greener on the other side joining a family business for the new generation person is most likely okay in most cases okay let me put it this way in some cases it might not be okay but in most cases it should be good um the first generation entrepreneur feels that i've gone through this rigmarole i've done i have managed the tax people i have managed the customer i have managed the you know suppliers i have managed the finances it's too much of tedium for my children i think they always feel that the grass is greener on the other side even when they do a job it's going to be equally difficult joining a family business is a big advantage for people it was a big advantage for me first let me give my example it gave me a great platform to start off from instead of starting off from scratch so if you look at a successful family business graduating the chances will become 50% higher than a startup succeeding succeeding or failing so as a startup or a family business growth family business growth will be more likely to be successful so i would personally feel that joining a family business is great acha new ideas bring new uh, new generation brings new ideas so when somebody joins a new business it brings a new ideas it brings in clash of the generations and this i have seen in many places the only way to solve this is having a proper respect for each other um typically i have seen many places where the son is afraid of the father he thinks the father is all old dated but he cannot do anything the old man thinks he doesn't have the experience he doesn't know anything so if you have that mindset that mindset of family business is much more difficult to succeed than a mindset where each of them understand the benefit of the other the youngster has to understand the experience and the hardship which the old man has gone through and which brings in a lot of value to the business and the old man also has to understand that things are changing and changing very rapidly and without new ideas and new ways of doing business the business cannot thrive and grow so the main thing about joining family business is to work on this understanding between the generation and a see a good amount of respect and interaction this is very difficult far easier said than done i mean i know i am sitting here and saying it it's so easy for me but this is the area which needs to be worked on but i still sincerely believe that 90% of the family businesses are worth joining worth scaling up and worth flipping so you know when i say you join the family business it doesn't mean that you go and join the family business and sit on the same chair and do the same thing which your father did you can always look at new ways of doing it i mean i'm just giving an example very cliche example of get taking your business online i'm just giving this so that it is a it is a very cliche example but there are so many new ways of doing things once you are in the business you'll realize that there is technology can be used the way thing Uh, the world has evolved can change the way the business can be done and the way you can search the entire environment uh, i have seen the elder generation is so afraid of the computer but a young generation will find the information in a jiffy so those are the things which we need to build up fantastic sir uh, i i'm going to ask you one personal question before i hand it so, over to uh, i'll just answer one question which is in the corollary question on the family business what if yes. the family business have brought the product to maturity stage and the next generation takes the takes up the business at that stage so i think this is the example which which i started i came into a thriving business which was growing very fast 10 years there was no business left so you have to keep growing on the business getting into new parts of the business it's not that you know i just totally went out of the same business uh, environment but the products and the services which we are doing were gone so i entered in that business phase itself in my own business we need to keep evolving along with the market see what else can be done so it's uh, the simple thing which in management classes which you talk about horizontal integration whether you can service the same customers in a better way 
can you do something to your raw material can you do something with your finished product and get into a value added product or can you use the same technology and do something else so with the same business in the majority stage you can look at this four areas where you can take the expertise of the business and move somewhere else so in our cases we took the same customer we took some technology and moved on we took some raw material advantage and moved on but the business got, went off so every business has some advantage which takes you into the next phase of another business i hope that answers uh, srija yes sir i think i think that's a brilliant answer and uh, on one hand it has kicked away my own question but let me dig deeper i was planning to ask you something about uh, yourself sir sorry uh, I, i was uh, i was planning to ask you something about your own family business uh, the question is what did your father or grandfather or your family uh, do to make sure that you come back to your family business is there any set of things that they did for you the I other side of that question is the other side of the question is also uh i know about your son do you think he is going to join your family business and what are the set of things that you are doing to attract him back into your business so uh, as far as myself i don't know whether uh, see we are talking about late 80s when a job was less attractive than it is today so those days a job was not really an option for somebody who had a family business today the set of uh, parameters are totally different uh and what did my father grandfather they exposed me to the business right from early on took me to the factories offices whenever uh, time permitted based on holidays or uh, you know just whatever is there as far as my son is concerned i was very clear right from the beginning that he is free to pursue whatever he wants but a little nudging like you know making do making him do an internship in the factory let him go to the factory and interact with some people creates an interest and awareness and also gives him an opportunity to understand that he can create value in that business so my son did a project as internship uh, in his 11th class that project became a success in his school and it got him an admission in his college and so automatically is inclined to see yes i can also create value in the business it's not just that you know like i gave that example of entitlement and responsibility i don't want him to feel that he is entitled to inherit the business but it, if he has the responsibility to grow the business then that is what uh, should bring him to the business whether he can ensure that he can do something more to the business so that's what i have done and hopefully it's there thank I you sir thank you uh, <laughs> hope so Th thank you sir uh, over to professor prasad for the next dimension of questions thank you sir you have uh, excited us with this concept of the adjacencies in the existing business and the value chain where where a lot of things can be done and i think that is a very very practical suggestion and uh, both for entrepreneurs as well as uh, perhaps uh, people from family businesses now uh, I, i come to the section on education and learning and i think you know the uh, you have yourself gone to i am bangalore done a program in management and a lot of uh, is a lot of engineering colleges and there is a question also about whether we should start something from schools when we should start what we should do so i'll just you know uh, uh, give the context integrate all the questions because we are at about 748 and we have already overshot our time so first thing is you know uh, what should mba programs do to develop entrepreneurial skills and uh, the other thing is can we start much earlier whether it is in school or uh, you know uh, uh, degree etc and uh, how do we uh, uh, encourage uh, more people to do uh, services related kind of uh, entrepreneurship because there's so many mba colleges and uh, engineering colleges and uh, how, what, what do you do to inspire all these students this is the set of question comes under learning and education a uh, lot of questions um, let me try and answer some of them uh, first of all uh, let me be very clear and i think uh, other than a very few less than 10% of the people who go to colleges will agree with me that what you learn in the college you forget immediately the only thing which come remains with you is how to learn to learn and that is a lifelong journey if you are confident of learning new things if you are confident of uh, not afraid of learning new things 
I think the job of education is done. Very few people, whether it's engineers or managers, actually use the theory taught in class in the practice in business. So there is a saying, I have learned engineering for four years. And after doing my engineering, the only thing I engineer is engineer people, that is manage people. So that is what is a practical situation of uh, learning. What can you do as an MBA college to en encourage entrepreneurship? So I think uh, entrepreneurship can be inspired more than educated. So while you can teach the um, uh, thoughts of um, entrepreneurships or the um, tenets of entrepreneurship, what makes a successful entrepreneur, passion, energy, risk taking. But I think what is going to uh, most likely connect is ex exposing your students to entrepreneurs. How you can expose students to entrepreneurs is a question which comes. One practical, uh, one way in most of the people do is go and do some projects in the society, ensure that you use your pull as a institute, make them interact with a couple of entrepreneurs here and there. That is one way of doing it. Getting entrepreneurs to your college is okay, but these are still have limitations and bounds. What would be a very good way of uh, teaching entrepreneurship is taking case studies of entrepreneurs who are successful and teaching in class. So you take a study of say Adi Lagarwal. What did he do in life? And a professor teaches him and the students uh, sort of uh, research what are the things which we have done and you discuss what he has done in class. You know, what has Steve Jobs done? What has uh, Chrysler done? What has Jack Welch done? So if you can teach people in your entrepreneurship class, that is what will inspire more people to become entrepreneurs. Make it a must do. You have to do what, uh, read about Jack Welch, discuss it in class, the teacher will tell you what has happened, make a small video or there must be videos available of uh, such leaders. Show that video for half an hour, 40 minutes and let the people discuss what do you learn from this entrepreneur. What are the tenets or the facets of this entrepreneur which made him successful and in spite of what feelings he was still successful. So those are the type of things which will really, you know, uh, push entrepreneurship as a class. It will inspire people because entrepreneurship more than teaching can be inspired. Thank you, sir. I think, you know, the practical tip there that uh, we take back away for institution is the, the objective of inspiration rather than educating and uh, the use of case studies to do so. And I think it, it works as well for innovation uh, in terms of the other other areas where management tends to teach and bring that into the class. So thanks a lot, sir, for that. Um, I, I, I get back to Mr. Sudhakar. This is the last section on uh, gender. Sudhakar, just before uh, you say that, I'm very happy to read one of uh, the uh, message on my daughter. Thank you very much, Sunita, for that message. My daughter will cherish that uh, message. Thank you. Yes, sir. I, I think you must convey this message to your daughter. Definitely. It's such a, such a nice endorsement. Very nice. Uh, <clears throat> sir, I have this question on this separate, uh, but one of the last buckets of questions is on gender. What about women entrepreneurship? What is the kind of su support that is available now or required for making women entrepreneurs successful? Uh, we all the time talk about and look at and see witness entrepreneurs who are men, generally speaking, but then women entrepreneurs are far and few. So what is the kind of support that's required to make women entrepreneurs also successful? And are there any intrapreneurial skills specific to women that one should teach or imbibe? Typically, I wouldn't want to uh, make gender specific comments, but uh, there are quite a few uh, schemes for women entrepreneurs, both of the state and the center. Uh, the one thing which uh, I've seen women is uh, their uh, emotional intelligence is far higher than men. They understand what is going on in a person's mind much better than men. And believe me, in business, in today's uh, world, emotional intelligence is almost always more important than mathematical intelligence. If you can understand what is happening in a person's mind, whether it is your employee, whether it is your customer, or whether it is your supplier, it's a very big advantage. And I have seen that women entrepreneurs are typically better off 
at emotional intelligence than men on a general scale, so to say. The only thing which uh, is keeping uh, uh, women entrepreneurship back is that, you know, uh, sort of safety, uh, ease of movement within the country, traveling, which happens a little less. That's the only thing which, you know, if that becomes much more acceptable and more people travel and move around, I don't think there's anything to stop women entrepreneurship. The same goes with the entrepreneurial skills. Uh, a woman uh, has much more emotional intelligence to understand what is happening. The problem is the male dominated society like India, the acceptance of a woman boss is a little difficult even today. So we need to change that mindset in uh, people's mind. I think that is more than anything else which can be collectively done by everybody else in the world. That uh, working under a female boss, you know, that uh, male dominant society, that mindset has to change. I don't know what, what's an easy way for that to do, but definitely by far I've seen emotional intelligence uh, higher in women and I think that's the biggest skill for an entrepreneur to support. Great, sir. So women uh, are uh, scoring high on emotional intelligence and that's a very important value for success uh, in entrepreneurship. Uh, that's a very important uh, note uh, for today. Uh, so <clears throat> uh, what I would like to uh, do right now is uh, I will hand over to Professor Prasad with a question to him. The question to Professor Prasad is, we have had uh, one and a half, uh, roughly one and a half hours of uh, session today. A uh, lot of learnings, a lot of insights, and uh, very good examples and analysis that has been done on uh, carefully drawn questions that we have presented to the guest. Now, what are the things that are designed as part of the online MBA program, ICFI's online MBA program, that you think will equip or it is taking care of the, the dreamer in the MBA student, that is uh, the dreamer. Uh, as Sir said, a poet is required. It's a combination of a poet and a baniya. So how are, our, how, how are our students, how is this MBA program going to equip our students with the dimension of a dreamer as well as the dimension of a baniya? Or what are the other sets of things that are embedded while architecting this online MBA program? Question to you, Professor Prasad. Thanks, uh, Mr. Sudhakar. That's a very interesting question and you've given me a framework to respond. And there are many, many takeaways from uh, today's session. In fact, you know, the, the, the entire journey through a learning program, if it becomes, and particularly a business program, if it, it, it becomes a journey to launch an innovation or launch an enterprise and you've got the comfort of two years to, and so many colleagues, whether senior, junior, and the exposure to uh, the corporate, if, if it is turned out into that, I think that is something that we can do better than many others. I think that's something that we should think about. And we, we have planned our program in that particular fashion. So we've got this practicum at the end of the, in the fourth semester, which is basically to target all that learning and then try and showcase an innovation. If you're an inno intrapreneur for your organization and try and showcase a startup by the, if it's too good, you can sell it right away. Or if it's, you know, you can get a funder. Uh, try and see what you can do. Start that imagination right from day one. And we have always been saying that imagination is far, far more important than knowledge. And the knowledge is good. But if you're able to connect that knowledge to imagination and you're able to build around the context that you work in. So for a lot of working executives who do our program, uh, they already have a very rich context. I think that uh, Surana sir has drawn in by talking about those adjacencies in the value chain where you can, you can connect. And a lot of things that we do, it's actually, you know, it's not that it doesn't have the potential, but having seen both sides, I can say that, you know, the, the conceptual framework of management has come from practice. It has not come from something else. So there is a potential in the classroom to connect it in a variety of ways. And uh, we have tried to do that uh, through the thousands and thousands of micro cases and nano cases, which are essentially small nuggets like three minute videos, five minute videos some example of something happening somewhere else. This is just to set a stage for the person to bring in and imagine, and then discussion is needed. So if the classroom triggers that as what can be done outside the classroom, and then you're able to bring it into the classroom, into a discussion forum, whether it's online in a discussion forum chat 
or somewhere else i think that sets a, a kind of you know a chef in motion the, the person who's doing the program eventually has to become a chef so chef is where you need both you need the art as well as you need the business so you need to you, you need to have that kind of a mindset and certainly it is learning to learn i mean if you do that then you may not start that business but i think your mind gets tuned in such a way that you 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 will know how to come up with uh, startup ideas and you know connect to it as well as deliver on it in brief this is what i would like to pitch in as far as the program design goes now it is 8 pm and i would like to with your permission conclude uh, this webinar and i must say that uh, mr devendra surana has really made this a blockbuster session it is so engaging i mean um, uh, my interaction with uh, uh, mr surana is not the first time and it's not going to be the last one but every time i have interacted both in person as well as uh, across uh, the screen uh, new sets of learnings have always emerged for me and i'm sure it is the same for all the members of the audience who are pre presently around the screen and also who are watching this live on different modes sir uh, it is a brilliant way how you have crafted the journey of your business evolving from the first generation to the second generation or third generation from there on it has become like tuning it to the realities at that particular time because you have always floated four five new ideas and made sure that you know at least one or two emerged out of that and this has been a continuous exercise so you have very well crafted and given us several tips on how to manage from first gen business to uh, the second gen business and as well and actually imbibe a set of values and uh, those counterintuitive tips to become a successful entrepreneur even if you are working within the organization entrepreneurship is more about risk taking and ownership whether you work for your own organization or work for some other organization i think on this uh, grand note with all your permissions i would like to conclude this and thank you once again for delivering a wonderful talk and responding to all our questions in a brilliant manner thank you very much sir and i thank all the members of the audience for joining and also patiently listening to the entire conversation beyond the time uh, that we have set for ourselves so uh, thank you once again to everyone please take care stay safe and do double masking if you have to go out it's anyway lockdown you may not have to go out but just in case there is an emergency please wear double mask inside it has to be n95 kind of mask and on top of it a surgical mask and extremely extremely important is to take care and only when it is really really required do venture out so wishing all the best for all of you and your families we sign off thank you very much